Ah, uh, geek out. Hey, welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Ken. <laughs> and uh, we've got a uh, we've got an interview. Uh, we've got somebody that was back on the show back in August. Woo! Uh, it's always cool when they come back because it means that one, we didn't scare them off, and two, they enjoyed it enough. Um, to uh, to make a return, or the publicist was like, "Hey, this is good press," or they forgot they were on the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've had that too. But the <laughs> I uh, forget that I'm on almost every episode. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, it's okay. Zach Kaplan. He's here to talk about his uh, book Eclipse, which is really cool because when he was here in August, it was at that time it was just a mini series. The first issue hadn't even hit the stands yet. Here we are, six months, almost exactly six months later. It's a full ongoing series. Second arc starts next month. First volume comes out uh, Wednesday, March 15th. Or, sorry, February 15th. It's February. I'm just getting ahead of myself. It's late. It's late, guys. We're recording this late. But, uh, Jake, you got anything you want to add? Uh, no, I mean, it's been... Uh, I'm Ken, by the way. But um, <laughs> it's... Uh, no, it's great to see, like you said, from miniseries to ongoing and... He's been nice enough to, you know, hell, listen to the show, let alone, you oh, know. Oh, there is a, Chris, can you uh, at the end or maybe as a separate soundbite for the listeners at home get that first bit when we first talked to Zach back in August and he basically reveals that he's done more research about us than anyone has ever done before. I'll see if I can find it and I'll put it right at the end of the episode. <laughs> cool. Or I could put it right here. Right. And I got and and I when I listen to some of your guys' podcasts uh, before, uh, it ranges from how many guys you have on it. So you have Sam and Jake, and then sometimes Chris and Josh. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're... Okay, so you got everybody, everybody today. Um, uh, we got uh, we got it's us. We got uh, Jake, and we got Chris and yeah. Sam. Oh yeah, and I'm yeah, Sam. Sam's yeah. the one that's. Sam, the one that is, uh, that was Sam. This is Chris talking right now. And, okay. Yeah, and I'm Jake. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Oh man, you've done your homework. Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, I think, shit. I think, I think you're the first person we've interviewed who's uh, listened to our show before. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Other than I guess like Corey and Nicole, uh, who are our friends. Oh yeah, Corey Murphy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, I did. <laughs> appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. the due diligence. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and let me get my uh, Walter Cronkite on. And, you know, I always like it when somebody comes back on the show. We've had that Absolutely. several times. Yeah. It means that, you know, they had a good time. So uh, I'd like to I like to think. And this is this week is one of those occasions. We've got Zach Kaplan, who's here. It's kind of a bookend because we had him talking about the uh, debut issue of Eclipse back at the end of the summer, um, which is appropriate because that it was a killer summer and this story oh, yeah. is about a killer son. Um and here we are, and we've got the first volume, which is out in comic book stores everywhere and uh, on Comixology on Wednesday, February 15th. So this is kind of a nice little debrief in a way. Zach, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I have to say, I feel like some congratulations are in order because I feel like it hadn't been announced that Eclipse was an ongoing series the last time you were on the show. And now here I we are. Yeah, I don't think so. I think when I, was cu- when I first chatted with you guys, it was all brand new and... Uh, and it was unknown. So, uh, in terms of what was going to, what was happening. So, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Congratulations. That's awesome. So I have to ask, this is your first major comic book work. Now that you've got one arc in the can and you're, you know, re- already presumably working well in the arc too. What have you kind of, what lessons, what takeaways have you had with that, with that experience? Oh my gosh! Uh, good thing you asked. Uh, uh, we were talking about the the amount of time we have here. Uh, we really could do a uh, a twenty four hour uh, session on yeah. what I've learned about uh, about uh, comic book uh, the world of comic books. Um, I mean, also for those of you who I don't know if you got if all all the listeners know. I mean, this is my first comic book, so uh, I've learned a uh, a lot. Um, I mean, it's it's a crazy world. I mean, first off, as a as a writer and I guess the the word creator, you you're kind of running it. You know what I mean? And so there is, um, I mean, good. It's like twenty percent, fifteen percent writing and eighty eighty five percent everything else. And uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, 
Uh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I feel like you. Well, I feel like you kind of jumped in the deep end, right? Because you didn't start with like licensed comics, where there's corporate controls and they already have like people in place for a lot of that. You started creator owned. Yeah, so do you that's think, right. Do you think that was kind of a? Do you think you needed that baptism by fire? Or looking back, what do you do? You think like ah, uh, you know, maybe writing a Superman book to start wouldn't have been too bad. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Listen, all I know is all I know is the experience I've had. It's been awesome, but uh, crazy all at the same time. Just because I'm learning everything, and so uh, I mean, it's it's there's a lot of stuff that comes down to promotion and marketing and cons and retailers and numbers and uh, final order cutoffs and sales and production and uh, coloring and lettering and all this stuff. And I mean. Um, uh, I will not pretend to that I knew uh, anything by the, when I was first starting off. I knew it, you know how to tell a good story, but there's a ton of ton of stuff. And so, I mean, I could give lessons on each facet. I think uh, in terms of of the road of it all. I don't know. Listen, I don't know if it would have been better to to cut my teeth on something else. Um, I certainly wouldn't have felt comfortable being trusted with a. Uh, with a big franchise or something like that. You know what I mean? I mean, even something like you say, like a transformers or something like that. I mean, people are reading that they expect a certain, uh, uh, polish. I mean, uh, it's, it, it, there's certain, um, at the very least with this one, it's mine. It's got my name on it. You know, all the, uh, uh, it's, uh, if, if I succeed, I succeed. If I fail, I fail. And, and, and so, I think maybe it actually doing it this way took off a little bit of the pressure. I don't know. One of the great things about this collection, this 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 uh, the book that's coming out of uh, the first couple issues, is at the end you have that peek into the creative process, which is what you're talking about. And yeah. so you go through, which I really enjoyed, and I think it's going to help a lot of people who may be looking to try to get into you know comic books and. You know, and I think it's a good thing too for like a lot of people that think that they have to go through a DC or Marvel first. And you're living proof that you don't have to do that. You know, no. it, at the end it shows. You know, you know this is the lettering process. This is the coloring process. This is this. You know, even for like you know a, a um, an up and coming writer just to see what a comic script looks like. You know, to help yeah. them along the way. So I think I think that's that's really helpful and really cool to see that in the back of the book. Yeah, I mean, we put a different process, and we're actually going to continue to do it. Uh, issues five through eight, you know, trying to let uh, readers have a glimpse into what's going on behind the scenes from the the writing. And so, yeah, what you're, you're talking about is the first issue we did showed how it goes from layout to pencils to inks. And, you know, that process, I'm collaborating with the artist Giovanni Timpano. And then there's the coloring pro. Oh, there's character design, which you're doing early on in the very beginning. And and uh, and then uh, coloring process, which we did with uh, Chris Northrup, and and lettering with uh, Troy Petiri, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's there. These are each step is a, a whole different process. That, but it's nothing. It, yeah, I don't think anybody should feel intimidated by the production process of it all. And um, I mean, the, this became this was. A monthly series and so there are deadlines to hit in something but you know especially if you're just go off making a comic book on your own you don't have the 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 timetable of you have to get out a um a cover in uh, four months ahead of time so that it can be in the previews book so that retailers can order it uh and you know that kind of thing so there's all sorts of uh uh, deadlines, but in terms of just making a comic book, yeah, people should, uh, should, you know, should not feel intimidated by the process of any of this stuff, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, but yeah, we were, we were very excited to include that and we've gotten a good response from people who liked seeing the, seeing the process of, of what we did. We'll keep doing that. How has working, you know, uh, you've got the, again, the first story arc under your belt now. How's that kind of informed how you've proceeded now with the, you know, issues five and six and all that sort of thing? Um, in terms of like what lessons or what have I taken from it, you think? Kind of both, both in terms of the narrative and yeah, I guess in terms of how the sausage is made. Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll really let you guys into the kitchen, um, to use the metaphor. Uh, I mean, this was initially promoted as a miniseries right and so when i'm given the green light to do eclipse 
you know, Top Cow is very supportive, but at the same time, they kind of assess as they go as to how long they're going to continue a series. If a series is, is it's kind of like television. If a series is continuing to get a good response, they're happy to continue to put it out. If the series is uh, not getting a, a good response, then they're not interested in investing more time into that. So I didn't know that I was going to get to go past four, which is a really tricky thing as a writer. You know, on the one hand, I can easily conceive of more story that I'd like to tell. But on the other hand, I have to have some resolution at the end of four. It has to be able to stand on its own to some level. So, uh, you know, the first arc does stand on its own. And then I get greenlit. Okay, you're going to get to do ongoing and have a second arc. And so then I'm like, okay, well, I get to have a second arc. And I probably will get a third arc, but it's still hard to conceive of where you're going. And so each arc, it's kind of, it's, it's hard. It's kind of like doing a season of TV, but you don't know if you're going to get canceled or something. So there's this, there's this, it's hard to determine how fast or slow. I think that's the pacing is one of the the things that I, I still struggle with as a new writer to determine how much story do I put into an issue? How, how slow do I, do I, do I do this? How fast do I do this? Do I make this really chug and have it be really like action and pulpy? Do I slow down and try to spend more time in the world, more time with the characters? So I think five for eight for me was, was kind of about trying to find a balance of pacing uh, and and find a, another arc that can stand on its own while at the same time setting up the franchise to be able to go to keep going. So it's tricky. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll come back in four and in uh, after eight, and you can tell me uh, how it's coming. But um, well, I do like that. I mean, I feel like uh, you know, looking at this first these first four issues in this first uh, collection, you've definitely got. Like certainly the cliff. How fun was it now to, to focus on the story a bit to write just increasingly imaginative ways to kill people with sunlight? <laughs> awesome. It was awesome. And um, I kind of I mean, that was always the, the idea. But then I, I really got to have a lot of fun with it. Now, I when I went into the second arc, I felt like I had set the bar on myself, almost like walking dead with like their zombie kills. Like now I'm like, even when I was mapping out five through eight i'm like okay i have to come up with more cool ways to kill people with sunlight and and try to keep the bar up there so um yeah but i mean it's 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 awesome to try to get imaginative on different ways to to have the sun be a threat and to kind of try to surprise the reader so they go oh wow that was cool i didn't see that coming that that way of killing somebody so yeah it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun to kill people with sunlight (laughs) I think I think our going back maybe it's in our book review we were just like the book it's just metal as fuck that's like our go to yeah nice. yeah and it's still definitely that I mean you know oh. there's there's some visuals I mean the art is still just top notch yeah Giovanni does a great job fantastic it's just like photosynthesize this yeah. <laughs> I know oh it's he's just brutal. crazy he's crazy and you know what else too I mean I'm all, if I wasn't lucky enough to get my first book with Image this artist. I mean, here I am approaching it because it's my first book. I'm approaching it like it's a passion project. You know, like it's really I'm pouring my heart and soul into it because it's my first book. And so I could have very easily gotten teamed up with an artist that was like, look, this is my 20th book. I'm going to send you the pages and I'm going to get it in there. But I'm not uh, it's not it's not something I'm passionate about. I'm just I'm just getting it in there. I'm getting the the. You know, I'm just going to do what it needs to be done. Not Giovanni. This guy um, pours his heart right back into it. I mean, I think people can tell. I mean, he is really, really invested in in the world creation and in the art. I mean, the level of detail. I can write a scene like we're in a tunnel and there's like a hundred people and uh, all this stuff's going on, and he just brings it. So yeah, he's killer. Now, throughout this entire this entire first arc, there's kind of this underlying theme of like one, one man, uh, you know, Baxter trying to not only regain his morality, but just uh, on a more macro scale, that's like just how humanity survives even under the worst conditions. Is that something, um, you know, without, 
getting too uh, you can get political if you want yeah i don't really, I don't really give a shit but like if, <laughs> <laughs> um how is that kind of will we be seeing those themes especially now more than ever like kind of continue on through the second arc yeah i mean for sure i mean it, what's the the second arc is i mean it's it's sim it's all similar things about how you face dark situations and and definitely arc one focuses on him trying to figure out whether or not he's how does he connect with society how does he get involved when it's not going his way i mean god i didn't even realize how possibly relatable that that stuff would be uh when i was first conceiving of it uh, when i think about the political climate it's it's pretty uh relatable the second arc was is is kind of similar stuff but um I don't think I think I can t t talk a little bit about it. Um, it, it focuses both on Cielo and Bax, and uh, I had a lot of fun um, bringing up Cielo's character and um, and letting her go through some of the things that Bax goes through in the first arc, and and seeing well how how does she feel about what's going on, and how does how is she going to um, approach it? So yeah. I, I don't know. I've always had that kind of I've always been drawn to stories that explore our relationship with society and our uh, and and how how connected or disconnected we get. I think I often get really charged up about what's going on in society. But at the same time, I get really um, I, I get torn on how much I want to commit or connect. And, and it's it's hard it's hard to determine how you're going to address the things going on around you. Are you going to seclude and just go, look, I'm just going to live my life. Are you going to get involved? I, I constantly find myself drawn to that kind of dilemma. So that's, yeah, that's a lot of the book for sure. Well, it's interesting. I didn't know that they would, uh, Baxter and, and Cielo would be teaming up in the second arc because I feel like a lot of that first arc without going into, again, the specifics, because this yeah. episode comes out the day volume one comes out. So uh -huh. listeners at home, you have no excuse. But the, uh, I feel like a lot of that first arc is Baxter overcoming trauma, whereas Cielo gets traumatized like some shit over the, over the course of right. that first well, arc. Actually, actually, they don't team up so much as the story follows them both. And uh, actually, the second arc it, it, it is about how she deals with the very trauma that she experiences in, in the first arc. What do, you, what do you do after that? Where do you go from from that experience because she she gets run around and i i uh she doesn't really get a breath she's really she really gets a, a bad deal of it in the first arc she, she's she's <laughs> in a lot of danger and so you know uh arc two gave me a chance to say well okay what what the heck does she do after that how does she feel about that what does that instigate for her so um, and then I, and then to explore a little more about where she comes from. I mean, much in the same way that, uh, in the first issue, I really like looking at both Bax's past and then how that kind of plays out in the present. Um, that's a trend that I want to, that I am going to continue to do in the second arc of looking at, looking at a character's past. And as you're kind of figuring out why they are the way they are, it's kind of deepening the dilemmas that you see them and you're like oh wow so this dilemma isn't just any dilemma this is like this is really significant because this person has already been through something that's similar to it so oh wow how do they how do they handle that kind of, how are we going to kind of see backs because uh, again at the at that first that first issue he's you know he's ignoring guys getting mugged for food he's just holding up and watching super bowl 42 as cool uh -huh. as super bowl 42 is the coolest yeah <laughs> Um, how, and of course at the, at the end, obviously, you know, if he continues on in the second arc, he's okay, at least physically, how yeah. are we going to, what differences are we going to see in his character moving forward? Um, I think it's the same, uh, dilemma. Um, but he's, he's still trying to decide how to deal with his own morality in this world and, and, and how to. Um, obviously there's, there's a lot more going on than just this killer who's using sunlight to burn people alive. And so in terms of what's going on behind the scenes and how this all came to be, uh, Bax still has some choices to make about, about 
how, what's he going to do? And I think you get, you get some idea of, by the end of the first arc, you get an idea of, of, of what, of a, a change in him and where he's going to go. But now he's going to get tested by that change. And it's, it's, it's kind of like when, when any of us say, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to live my life a little more this way. And then life goes, okay, well then if, if you're going to live your life a little more moral, morally or involved or whatever, well, how would you handle this situation or how would you handle that situation? So I don't want to give too much away because um, I don't want to talk too specifically about where arc one ends, but um, but he's definitely going to uh, face the same themes of of being connected and morality and 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 uh, yeah, what what he'll do in those situations. Now the uh, to kind of turn it on to the antagonist a bit. And um, in the when we were talking issue one way back when, uh, the uh, the antagonist of that arc really kind of represented the hopelessness, the absence of connection, or there there is this kind of like almost nihilism to its most extreme. What can we expect from the antagonist, or what do they represent juxtaposed against Bax moving into arc two? Um, that's that's uh. Or is that giving too much away? (laughs) I don't want to give too much away, but I think, um, I think that, yeah, the, the first character, the, the villain, the villain in the first arc is very nihilistic is the perfect word for him. And, you know, he's, he's lost all, you know, meaning to life and he's, he's really in a dark place. Um, I was interested in arc two of looking at characters who uh, are the are the op who are maybe the opposite who are maybe justifying their actions just justifying dark actions justifying bad things and uh, but um, not they haven't they haven't accepted that they're evil or they're dark but they actually think they're the good guys um that makes it harder i think it makes it harder on characters it's very easy to say i'm going to stay disconnected when you think that the world is full of guys who are just trying to destroy it when you get involved or you try to get involved or try to fight for morality and you find that the antagonist genuinely believes in their cause and their actions that makes it harder because now um, what, yeah. So, so yeah, I, 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 I think that that's as vague. That, <laughs> that gives me a little bit of a, without giving too much away, but I think the second arc is definitely looking at, uh, similar themes, but, but different antagonists, antagonists who are, who are making, um, who are, um, being more reasonable and, and believing that they're doing the right thing. Starting with issue two, we had started to see like flashbacks into the, I guess the moment of, what is it? It's like the moment. The flare, of, yeah, the day yeah, of the flare. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are we are we going to kind of see more of the how Bax reacts to that? How you know humanity rebuilds after that? Um, we, there's also some indications we see some glimpses or at least influences from the outside world from say like Washington D.C. Uh, yeah, be, being from you know Washington D.C. and living right outside of it, really, um, are we going to start to see a bit more of a bit more outside of New York moving forward? We do see more outside of New York, but I think in general, it's the you know the the world building is is a slow burn, and like I said, it's a balance because I'm also trying to make room for the characters and and trying to stay with the characters and and, and create. Um, an exciting thriller with actions and sun kills. So yeah, we, we do get to see some of outside of New York. I think actually the issue five cover, which is out shows backs, uh, leaving New York city. And, um, uh, so that we, we do step outside of New York, uh, proper and get to see a little bit more. And I think at every turn, I'm trying to plant a little bit more here, a little bit more there about the world to try to, to continue to, explain it and slow burn it. Um, but I think even by the end of the second arc, there's, there's going to be mystery. There's, I think there has to be some mystery to what happened. I think that's what makes it so enjoyable. You're trying to figure it out and you're, you're, you have this city that's functioning 
And I think that's what makes it a little bit unique in the post-apocalyptic kind of landscape that this city is still functioning and yet so much is not and trying to put the pieces together. And I've had so many people come up to me and be like, well, what are they doing for food? What are they doing for this? You know, and I'll say, well, they're, they, they're doing all sorts of things for food. And then that's a way to like go back in and as I continue to do it, to put, put answers to those questions in small ways. I mean, it's not going to be like five pages that revolve around the food, but you know, if you look, you're going to see it here and there, um, kind of, um, little answers. So, um, yeah, I'll, I, I'm continuing to try to ex- expand the world for sure. As an as a quick aside, and I'm not gonna uh, without going into huge specifics. There, in one of the issues in that first arc, we see a guy running a food truck, and a dude totally dies, like not related to the food truck man, dies in the in the passenger seat or in the in the cab. And I feel yeah. I feel so sorry for food truck man because he's just <laughs> selling like street tacos, and some dude just like dies in his fucking drivers. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, speaking of the sun kills, which is such a great name for it, when you're like out about in your daily life, do you like catch a shadow or the way the sun creeps into a room or something? And you're just like, that would be the best way to kill somebody (laughs) with the sun. Does that come? Does that like is that in your mind when you're walking around just like, oh, like I could use it like this or the way that this window falls? You know, does do you get ideas like that just from everyday life? I don't. I get my ideas from... <laughs> that just, that just made me sound like a psycho. When I'm in my everyday life... Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, writing is so weird because yeah. the ideas come to you at the oddest of times. And I, I think they I think they come to you when you're out in the real world, but you're not actually thinking. it. So they just sure. like... Your brain absorbs them. And then when you're actually doing something else, it'll come to me. Or I, all the time driving. I get a lot of ideas driving when mm-hmm. I'm driving you know, 30 minutes across town or something and I have nothing to do but drive, I'll be thinking about the story and I'll be like, oh my God, that's, I, I have to do that thing or I have to do this thing. Um, yeah, I also have a weekly poker game. I'm a huge poker nut and there have been one or two nights where I was like, okay guys, sun kills. Give me, <laughs> give me everything. And like literally for hours, sun kills. we would just uh, have fun brainstorming sun kills. So uh, I have a list of like, you know, 50, 100 sun kills at this point. Oh, and amazing. then I'm just looking at the story going, okay, what what's going to happen in this issue? So I've tried my best to come up with as many as possible um, so uh, that I'm armed. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's fun to think about the sun uh, when you're out in, in the normal. I, you know, at locations, I, I mean – locations will stick with me i'll be out somewhere and i'll see something um you know casting a shadow and that'll mm-hmm. that'll stay with me so yeah for sure yeah this always the sun kill is just such a perfect <laughs> kill you know what i mean like it's it just it's so final and there's just there's just yeah. no remorse so, to it it's so just it's, horrific too. oh yeah it's not like oh man it's like they're just gone it's like yeah. you know it's not like star trek where they just like disappear yeah it's like sarah well, connor in like t2 grabbing onto the to the fence you know just getting blown away <laughs> It's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, and we've had to be very like, very consistent. Like, look, here are the rules. The sun touches you. You're done. Okay. It ha- mm-hmm. it can't be ambiguous. It, it has to be the, like you put your hand out in the sun, your hand is toast. You're in so much pain. You're probably going to fall over. You're done for mm-hmm. like, it's, it's gotta be final. It, it, cause it, you know, um, that's the that's the the rules of the world. So uh, we're very you know we're very um, we're, we try to focus on that. I'm always looking at panels when there's sun because a lot of the the story involves the hero and and the characters skirting right up to the edge. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? In um, in issue four, which is the climax of uh, of the first arc, the climax takes place. Uh, where they're literally uh, trying to avoid um, the sunlight by by like staying in moving shadows, and um, you know they're always flirting with with sunlight. So we as artists and creators have to be very careful not to break the rules in any way and have someone be like, "Wait a minute, they're in the sunlight and they're not burning." It has so 
it has to be fine that final for sure um but yeah it's awesome it's it's great and I, one of my favorite pages to see come in is the the burnt body pages those are the best <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and, and i never need i never need to say anything when those come in i mean when those come in it's it, the artists you can tell the artists are having fun just boiling skin and burning and everything and just like yep that's awesome thank you yeah and there's just like the gurgling sound effect for like some people and you're just like yes. good god yeah yeah yes more gurgling <laughs> more to the liver. More can you make the gurgling bigger please more gurgling it's like yeah. you get like the, the shots of like windows getting burst you yeah. just see like like the sun ray basically blasts like people's like faces off yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of fun to write. It's a lot of fun to write for sure. You, I, if I remember correctly, you were saying, you know, speaking of coming up with story ideas while you're driving and, and being a poker aficionado, you had come up with this while driving from like dealing poker games. Yeah, well, yeah. I was uh, did I tell this story on your guys' show or some somewhere else? I think we we yeah. have a version of it. I don't know. Yeah, I'll tell it again. Uh, yeah, the short the short and sweet is I was a poker dealer. I drive home at sunrise and the streets would be empty. And that was that experience of being out in empty streets where it was just me and the sun was the kind of kernel that stuck in my head and made me go, what if that was the world where um, it was just you and the sun and uh, and nobody else was out? What if you couldn't go? What if they couldn't go out in the sunlight? What if you couldn't go out in the sunlight? What if you were the only one that could go out in the sunlight? And so that was kind of where where it all came from. Um, the best ideas come from like those kind of experiences where you, where you experience something and then you just kind of bend it into a story for sure. Now you were mentioning some of your influences with this first arc were kind of sci-fi dystopian crime stories. I guess yeah. there are, are there any happy are they they're all dystopian, aren't they? No, yeah, they're, dystopian they're, they're, they're in no happy. nature, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are no happy sci-fi crime stories. I don't think yeah. yeah, I think so. Star Trek is maybe as close as it gets, but they don't really solve crimes. They just have groovy adventures in space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they leave a lot of carnage in their in their wake. Yeah. I, there's a lot of planets that they visit that it doesn't turn out too good for the inhabitants, and then they just move on, going, "We should try better to follow them." <laughs> oh, sorry directly. about that. So. Yeah, we're explorers. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, guys. We probably shouldn't have woken up that monster on your planet, but we'll save eight of you guys in our shuttle. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you were mentioning some of your influences. You know, obviously. Uh, um, Omega Man or Last Man on Earth, yeah. Um, Blade Runner. What what ex- what influences are we going to kind of see going into the second arc? I think it's the same stuff. Um, I'm trying to keep it really consistent. I'm trying to keep. I mean, e- Eclipse has its toes in two different kind of worlds, and I and the second arc perfectly balances both of those. On the one hand, we've got this post-apocalyptic kind of vibe and outside of the city has been kind of left a wasteland and so we're definitely going to see uh some of that and then there's a city and the city's dystopian there's tunnels there's lots of people there's lots of secrets there's lots of stuff going on in the shadows and so um that that's the the blade runner and, and the other ones like the mad max and and so the second arc is kind of perfectly trying to balance that that those two kind of um arenas i guess so so yeah i would say that but i kind of wanted i kind of want to stay true to that you know if we it, you know if and when we do a third arc it would be the exact same recipe for me in terms of continuing to see the, the dystopian city and then what's going on outside which is not as civilized the cursed earth saga. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what other cursed earth sagas are there. I mean, you've got Mad Max which is totally post-apocalyptic. Uh you've there's got, uh I, there's Judge Dredd was the 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 first big arc they ever did with Dredd was was he he goes he from Mega City 1. There's a virus called the Tutti Fruity virus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh Judge Dredd? Yeah. It's it's They're British, they can get away with yeah, it. Yeah. It's like the way it's spelled out like it's not spelled Tutti Fruity, but like it, it they take that name because of like the the different symbols and stuff they come up with. And so Dredd basically goes it's the first big arc they ever did in in Dredd. So it is very like 
tongue in cheek, but he basically goes from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, outside of the mega cities into the cursed earth to find the the uh, the cure, and then basically crawls back to Mega City One just in time to get back for his next shift, and then just goes back into the streets and saves the day. It's pretty great. I think I think uh, you know he comes across the mutants, and I think I don't remember if that's when the talking Tyrannosaurus Rex comes into place, but. Um, <laughs> It's yeah, it's for crazy. For the sake of story, we'll just say yeah. Yeah, for the sake of story, we'll say that's when the when the T Rex showed up. I've forgotten how grounded Judge Dredd was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty grounded in the in the in the world of Dredd. Could happen. Could happen. I oh don't yeah. Remember, I I think they left out the Tyrannosaurus Rex in the movie. Yeah, I think they were waiting for the budget, hopefully, to go up in the second one, and then they could have they, they could throw. They him probably would have. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, we get Despicable Me too. Despicable Me too, and not Dread too. I'm still holding off for the the Dread net. Everything just should be a Netflix miniseries. You know, that's just point. the way it should. be. Well, yeah. The way totally. the, the way that they they do it, they let him just they let them go crazy with it. You know. Yeah. So. No holds barred. But I'm trying to think of other kind of wasteland. I mean, there's um, Fallout. Um, the yeah. video games. There's. Uh... I mean, so much. Fallout, yeah. Fallout's a good touchstone. In fact, I think Giovanni uh, plays that a ton. Mm. So I, he might have even got into it for uh, for like inspiration mm. of you know how to draw what to where you know to just draw from uh, some of the different landscapes there. Um, yeah. It's it's hard. There's not. I feel like there's you either have stuff where there's a city like Blade Runner, Judge Dredd, and you know, minority report, or you've got your wasteland. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, I got both, I guess. So, uh, I get to play around in both two sandboxes. So I'll continue to do that. Uh, Speaking of playing, you know, obviously media influences, as you may recall, we always ask this, but what are you currently geeking out over? What am I currently geeking out over? Um, God, I have so much to watch. I'm trying to think. Oh, I'm I am finally uh, two thirds of the way through Stranger Things, ah, and nice. I am geeking out over that. I'm um, where am I? Five or six episodes in, and uh, loving that. That's uh, that's great. That's some fun stuff. Um, I got a long list. I mean, I I got a uh, I really want to watch Taboo because I'll watch anything with Tom Hardy. Yeah, I haven't watched that yet. I I uh, I need to get on that. Yeah. But I mean, I've seen This Means War. Oh yeah, Tom Hardy. Indeed. Yeah, <laughs> See, yeah, he's in that. This means war. <laughs> you gotta watch anything with Tom Hardy. That's right. Um, you guys uh, see Peaky Blinders? That what got me. Uh, I mean, Tom Hardy's so awesome. Oh, that. I mean, him and Killian Murphy really. I mean, they just it's. It, it, yeah. yeah, I feel like for some reason that's under the a little more. Under it the is. Radar. I remember when like it came out, like I I felt that I was I'm pretty good on the Tom Hardy radar of like things are going, and I I hadn't heard of Picky. I mean, I I know about Picky Binders now, but when it first came out, I just I had no idea about it. And it's I, such an underrated show. Yeah. I really I'm confused as to why that show doesn't get more uh, acclaim or eyeballs because it's so good. It's yeah. so fun. Um, I mean, it's like. Breaking Bad in uh, 1910 Gangster. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. The problem is there's so much content that like I don't get to watch anything when it comes out. I feel like I'm always ca- – I don't know about you guys. I don't know how, how you guys stay in on it all. I, I'm always catching up. I mean I, you say what am I geeking out on? It's like I'm geeking out on Stranger Things or you know I – I finished Westworld about three weeks ago, um, you know, but it's so hard to keep up with everything. Well, I mean, but, uh, I mean, without, you know, spoil revealing too much of your like personal life, you're a family man, too. <laughs> so, I am. I'm a family man. Listen, comic books is a busy thing. I mean, just so uh, I- I'm looking at layouts right now for issue seven. I'm looking at uh, rough colors for six because we just finished colors on five. I'm uh, finishing a polish on the five script so we can get some uh, letters done for issue five. Just came from uh, uh, Image Day appearance. Mark Silvestri was uh, appearing at Golden Apple here in L.A. uh, And he was promoting a, a Top Cow book with Matt Hawkins. I was down there hanging out with the the guys and celebrating image day and uh you know i'm doing uh 
some convention booking. I got to book some plane tickets. I got to do some uh, press for the trade. Uh, I'm getting hit up for the volume two uh, solicit so we can get the book uh, out in previews. I mean, it just never, it's just a bunch of stuff. And none of that has to do with conceiving of a story or coming up with characters or thinking of cool sun kills. So there's just a ton of stuff to do. Um, Are you doing the Emerald City thing? I'm 50-50 on Emerald City. Uh, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to make it work. Okay. I'm doing I'm doing East Bay Comic Con. I'm doing Long Beach Comic Con. I'm doing C2E2. I'm doing Comic Palooza. And that's so far. And then um, I'll do San Diego, and then I'm trying to fill in more, I'm trying to get to get out there and, and uh, hurt myself uh, doing too much. So <laughs> I'm off to a good start. Right on. Um, yeah, because uh, Jake and I are in for, for Emerald City. We'll be working the image booth, so. Well, I'll try. If I, I'll definitely stop by. I have, a, I have a pro badge, and Top Cow has some, but I didn't get an Artist Alley thing. So I'm, I'm, if I'm going, I'm going as a fan. Or I'm going um, and I'm just hanging out at, at other people's booths, uh, so I'm trying to figure it all out. But uh, right on, but right. I hear I hear Emerald City is is the bomb. I hear oh, it's, it's great. awesome. It's great. I my yeah. my nerd thing. I I went for the first time last year to to, to volunteer at the image booth uh, as well. But my thing I wanted to do most there besides the con was <laughs> because we're in Seattle. I booted up the pilot to Fraser and I watched. Uh, Frasier while in Seattle, and that was like my favorite. Thing. That's like the nerdiest did, thing I could do. It was so did it cool. Resonate like in a whole new way. It did. I mean, I was Seattle? like, I, it, I, it's, I sense it more. It's like you know, the ultimate experience. Like, and you know, it didn't rain though when I was in Seattle. I was actually really pissed off about that because we, I, when I got back and I landed in Dulles, it was pouring here in Virginia, and I was like, well, I know it rains in Virginia, like it, you know. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I was, I, the guy I was, uh, uh, uh shared the room with. Uh, I turned him on to Frasier because I was like, you know, your first experience is watching in Seattle. Do you watch uh, Seinfeld when you're at New York Comic Con? I we, we did. I watched. I it's, I swear to God, like when we were at New York Comic Con, I fell asleep watching reruns of of uh, Seinfeld. What else? You could do uh, Portlandia in Portland. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like we could, we could get a whole list together for you here. There we uh, go. Where does um, Bloodline take place? Down in the Keys? You can go do Bloodline down in the Keys. <laughs> this would be, it would be like the, the, uh, just some travel Game channel of Thrones, show. Game of Thrones you can do in Canada or something maybe. Yeah, there you or go. DC. DC is Game of Thrones now, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I, was, I was watching a promo. Speaking of like uh, Netflix and everything, I saw a promo for like House of Cards. Like, who the fuck is going to watch House of Cards this season? <laughs> we're living House of Cards. <laughs> yeah, we're watch, I watch it every morning when I turn on the news. I don't know that I... Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh boy. Uh, yes, yeah. Crazy world. Yeah. Crazy world. Is and then here sh- we yeah. here we are talking about comics. I guess we need something to escape into, right? Well, I oh, feel yeah. like you know you read stuff by like Remender, and it's very reactionary. Like you read Tokyo Ghost, or you read um, uh, what was it? Low. I mean, especially Low, right? Because they're like kind of like Eclipse. They're sheltering themselves from the sun. They just do it underwater. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm not caught up all the way on Low, but I read all of Tokyo Ghost, and so. He, it's very interesting because the, one of the antagonists is a billionaire, right? Right. Uh, who's kind of out for some world power. And he starts to talk a lot like Trump by the time we get a few issues in, right? Mm-hmm. And then he, it, they even seem to start to talk about some of the social class stuff going on. It seems like it really taps into i wonder if he knew that he was going to do that from the get-go it feels like that was something that he infused into it as he was going right yeah and then spoilers for tokyo ghost he's ousted by the devil he brings the wolf he brings into the fold Mm. i mean it's funny because we were talking about dread and t-rexes and all of it not being grounded but when all of this was going on the um the there's a character in the dread universe called president booth and he's known as the last president of the United States of America. And it's because he uh, he wins the election illegally. And then he basically starts World War Three by turning everyone against the United States of America. Hmm. And um, and then the judges have to, like, you know, up, you know, rise up and and, and, and take the power back, power back, so to speak. But I remember, yeah, I remember reading this. And uh, there's a great book. The best anyone who ever uh, wants to read Judge Dredd has never read Judge Dredd. I always 
turn to the book Judge Dread Origins, which tells the whole story of how the judges got started. You know, Dread as like a 12 year old clone going on his first, you know, mission with his brother Rico, all that kind of crazy stuff. But I remember like rereading it around the, the, the presidential time and I was like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> I don't want to live Judge Dread. I just like to read Judge Dread. But it, yeah, it is creepy. Like a lot of that stuff is like, you know, it's gr- granted, it's, you know, it's, ask John Wagner what happens next for yeah, all of us. Seriously. Yeah, seriously. Christ almighty. Um, it, it's crazy, but I, I, uh, I'm always torn between, uh, in terms of, a, in terms of comic books, if I, if I want that or not, you know what I mean? Oh, Sometimes sure, yeah. I get there like in Tokyo ghost and I'm like, yeah, this is resonant. But then on the other hand, it's, it, uh, we're living it. We're living such this crazy thing. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's an in, it's interesting to to see how comic books will continue to reflect it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess even I have have uh, some opportunities as I keep going of, of of what social commentary do I choose to infuse into uh, uh, Eclipse? I mean, Eclipse has already got some some undertones of like meritocracy and and uh, uh, corporate corporate dominance, and so. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's inter- it's interesting. You know, you were talking about how packed your schedule is with with Eclipse. Have you considered pitched, storyboarded? I mean, you don't have to tell us, but you can totally tell us. How, do you have another kind of another title separate from Eclipse? I, and- I think I can tell you what I can't tell you. And so <laughs> I have another project that is on the ground and uh is in the works and um and I think that's all I can I can say about it at this point. But it, but we're we're getting started on on another uh, thing, and so we'll uh, when we when we can say more, then I'll then I'll say more. <laughs> I don't know that I'm I don't know. That, again, being so new, you never know what you can and can't say, and then so I always have to err on the side of caution and just be like, I don't know what I'm allowed to say or what I'm not allowed to say and when I'm allowed to say it. But and then someone will come to me and go. You didn't have to keep quiet about that. You could have said then. I'll be like, oh, I, I, oops, I didn't know. But um, better safe. Yeah, I'm working. Yeah. I'm working on another idea, and it's and it's and it's it's in the starting phases. And uh, yeah, I I am. I've never been a kind of writer that is um short on ideas. I would. I definitely have goals of trying to do some more projects, and um, maybe may, you know, definitely by the time the year's out. So uh, it the comics take a long time. You know, you, by the time you, you pitch an idea, you put it together, you start to get it going and then you write it and all this and solicit and all that stuff. I mean, it, it's not something that you just turn out in six months. Um, it, these things, uh, I've learned take, take a bit of time to put together. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, we don't yeah. want to be the ones to get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, you you'll uh I am working on some more ideas. And I and I, I and it's and I uh am staying in the sci-fi uh world and and I think I think most of the stuff I am going to try to do is going to be grounded sci-fi that has some sort of thought-provoking uh premise that also makes you think a little bit about about society. I don't I like to kind of have that kind of undertone to it. So, um that's kind of that's kind of where I like to live, and uh, but yeah, I I think I'll have to wait to to give you guys any more on the on on future projects for now. Well, we wait we wait in anticipation. That's right. Thanks. So, uh, so yeah, is there anything uh, you want to um, kind of anything else you want to tease about these upcoming second arc of uh, Eclipse before we kind of sign out? No, I think we <laughs> we, <laughs> we did, you check it out. It, it's uh, check out the the volume one comes out. It's ten bucks. It's uh, uh, check it out if you like it. Uh, then five comes out right after that. And uh, um, you listen. You know what? You I, I want the only thing I'll circle back to because I, I I promoted enough and chatted enough about what's coming. But you asked me like what I've learned, and and, and you know, and I was like, oh God, where to start? But but the reality is like uh, I got super lucky getting my first comic book with Image. But anybody who's out there listening who is an aspiring creator, an aspiring writer, uh, you you should just start creating. Find an artist, um, you know, team up and and um, 
and and create because uh, uh, here I am talking about all like the production and the management, all the work. But at the end of the day, it's it's not that it's not hard to create, but if you find a collaborator and the two of you work and you create something wonderful, there's a lot of opportunity out there to to have it seen. I really do. I, I really do in my heart of heart believe that that people are looking for good stories and good work. So um, I think if anything, despite all the hard work that I've been through, I've been very inspired by, by the process of doing Eclipse and, and very inspired by how receptive the industry is. Everyone's they're, they're, they're genuinely picking up each comic book looking for a good story. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I, I, I have no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you guys could tell me if you if you think that there's a different facet, but I feel like Marvel, DC guys, everybody's willing to pick up a comic book and check it out and see if they like it. Everyone's looking for a good story. So I think I, I've been very inspired by it all. Oh, I mean, you know, I just we're recording this on like you, you were saying it's it's Image Comics Day. It's the 25th anniversary. It's the moment where you know the more underground world of niche of independent comics. Start, became irrevocably part of the mainstream here in America, yeah. and it was really and the, and, the, and the image stories that are being told today, and and other publishers as well. I mean, what a comic book is is so unique and awesome and original. I mean, it seems like each year I see more crazy, cool titles where I'm like, wow, that is a crazy comic book that I never would have thought I would have seen before. You know, so. I think it's it's such an awesome medium right now, and it yeah it all it you look back 25 years ago to when Image first started, and they were setting the trend for for telling something different, and it's it's changed the landscape. So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's I had to um, I I don't know if you saw any during the uh, any of the signing events, but. I wrote a 25th anniversary special, like a, one of those like free pamphlet things or that they hand out for the company where I wrote like the 25 books that help make image what it is. And it was yeah, just really, I have it right here. Oh, you, flip that, that was yours. Flip that, uh, that front cover and read who wrote the content. Yeah, man. Here's my dang thing. Is that you? I have it around here somewhere in my, in my <laughs> crazy office. Yeah. I was thumbing through it and I was like, never heard of any of these titles before. <laughs> Surely, Spawn, uh, the Walking Dead. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it, it's a it's a great list, and it's the kind of list that really a, a comic book fan should, or especially an image fan, you have to read all of them. They're they're all so great. Yeah, it was um, cool tracing that history. Yeah, how was it to do that? It to, was well. There was to kind of invite you into my own kitchen. Um, it was to show how that sausage was made. That was something. That was really – there was a quick turnaround time there, and that was really um, – I mean, that was that was really like Kat and, and every the everybody that kind of helped assemble that. And they were just like, could you write a page about each of these books? And I was like, yes. And I had basically like a week to do it. So it was a marathon run. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Yeah, but it was a lot of have, fun. Have you, I, I won't put you on the spot and ask if you've read all 25 of those books, but the, they're 25 great series for sure. I, I ha- mean, I mean, I had to, but I didn't read them all like start to, certainly not something like Savage Dragon that's like over 200 issues deep at this point. <laughs> yeah. But, but I read like the first volume for like every single book just so I could have like at least a frame of reference if I had never read it before. And it was, yeah, it, it, there was a lot of late nights that week. That that's the other like, as as I'm curious to ask you guys as as geek aficionados, do you how do you stay up on all the stuff on all the comic books? Because I I as a creator who's a, who's I mean I've always been a fan, but now I feel even more pressure to read what's out there, to learn from what's out there, to to understand different art trends and writing trends i'm sure you guys are trying to read as much as you can there's so many not just comics but good comics right how do you guys Mm -hmm. well chris and i chris and i get like less than six hours of sleep true (laughs) (laughs) reading because you're reading so much I, we could attribute it to that, I'm sure. I mean, if insom- if insomnia sounds too boring, then yeah. <laughs> what's an average? What's an average amount of comic books that that you guys read a week? 
eight to thirteen. Yeah, issues, I mean it, issues or volumes. You're talking issues. Ish, um, well, actually, what I do is because I I pick up eight to thirteen books at like issues at the comic book shop every week, and I you know will either if I'm reviewing something for Image, they'll send me the you know the advanced PDFs, or if there's something on sale on Comixology for like five bucks, I'll pick that up. What I end up doing, and this is just insane now that I'm kind of saying this out loud, every day I read five issues or five chapters of something. So I will knock out, say, like five chapters of uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes by like Ray Bradbury. Or maybe I'll read um, whatever, like a third of my haul for the week Mm -hmm. in a single day. So I'm reading, I guess, seven times five, 35 chapters or issues per week. 35 issues. That's a good, that's good. That's a good amount. It's funny because like my thing is, I'm never up to date on anything uh, with comics. I mean, like, there's there's certain characters I love. Like, I'm a big Superman nerd, and and I really like what they're doing a lot with Rebirth. So, you know, I'll, you know, I'm reading that. You know, and the, and the the He-Man uh, Thundercats crossover is just the most glorious thing in the world, um, and so much damn fun. But but then, like, I I used to work at a Blockbuster back when those are still a thing. And my way of of that wait, was wait, what do, do you need to tell everybody who's listening what a blockbuster? Yeah, yeah, maybe I will. Yeah, back in the day, you had I to know, actually. We, I feel like we've talked about blockbuster. Yeah, you have to go episodes. and pick you it up. Your cards, I've seen. Them. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you couldn't just you know click on Voodoo and have it there in instantaneously with no late fees. But um, what I would do is, is is similar. What I used to work at a comic shop too. What I would used to do there is I would just pick a character and just bleed them dry and read as much as I could about them. Um, and it's weird because I, my thing is just like something will catch my eye. Like for example, right now, like I'm reading everything I can about She-Hulk. And if you would have asked me like four months ago, I I had never really read any She-Hulk and I wasn't that interested in reading She-Hulk, but they just, uh, they've been releasing the John Byrne, uh, run and in a really nice trade paperback form. And yeah, it's just, uh, and and similar to like what what Sam says, you know, I, I, I try to read, um, you know what I can and I try to just just slowly chip away at it and then the same kind of thing I would tell like an overwhelmed new comic fan when they come into the comic shop for the first time and they would be like I you know what do I and I'd say just hone in on one thing hone on hone in on if you know a writer if you know an artist if you just know a character if the world's too big make it small yeah yeah (laughs) the world's too big mom um but you uh you just hone in on that one thing and then it's like like the reverse this is so dumb it's like the reverse onion like shit will just start piling on Uh, i guess that's also a snowball but like um (laughs) stuff will start you know piling on and then you build what you like from there and the great thing is like and i know you you know you'll you'll probably agree with this too is is when you just surprise yourself with stuff you read like you know you'll go home you'll see something at a shop and you, you know you go in on a wednesday like for me with she hulk i had no idea going in that day i remember sam and i grabbed uh coffee afterwards and I, I was like, I guess I'm reading She-Hulk now, um, and it's fun, you know, it's great. And that I think that's that's what's so great about comics is there's so much to read that you can never possibly, you know, quench that curiosity or that creativity or inspiration to to want to keep checking things out. And, yeah. And and so yeah, I guess yeah. my my the way my way is I'm a I'm a completionist too. Yeah. I don't know, like. Uh, it, when I'd play video games, it was always terrible because I'd be the one that decided I needed all 42 variations of the flower in the hills. Like, to, <laughs> so I had 42 of 42 flowers. Like, yeah. I just get caught up on the the. So if I'm in a series, even if it starts to lose me, I really feel like I need to finish it mm-hmm. so that I can understand it and comprehend it. Sure. So I never, I never really stop anything. I I keep reading stuff to 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 good or bad or mediocre or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there, but uh, there's just a lot. Yeah, snowball, it's just an onion snowball. An onion snowball, yeah. the well, worst, <laughs> <laughs> the I, worst thing in the world. I think it was Mark Wade that said there's more content produced in a single year than someone can like digest in their entire lifetime. Mm-hmm. And there is something both intimidating and liberating about that. Because on the one hand, it's like, oh, I don't have to do it. But on the other hand, it's like, well, I will never see everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but you know. Yeah, but yeah. So again, the uh, first volume of Eclipse is out in comic book shops everywhere and on Comicsology on Wednesday, February fifteenth, and it comes back at the start of its second arc with issue five everywhere on uh, Wednesday, March fifteenth. Zach, thanks again for coming on. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Great talking with you. What a fantastic interview. Yes. Uh, uh, Eclipse, again, by uh, Zach Kaplan, is out in comic book shops everywhere um, on Wednesday, February 15th. And keep an eye out for, for the second story arc starting next month. It's it's going to be wild. It takes it on the road. Nice. So, Ken, you're here with us, especially this, this uh, episode to uh, apparently the... Um, one of the original scripts, I think the Max Landis script for mm-hmm. the uh, upcoming Power Rangers film is finally leaked online. That's right. That's right. And, and it wasn't by him, too. Like, it wasn't like an on-purpose leak. Like, somebody else on Reddit found it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him tweeting That's... out. Because, like, I know some people, like Ryan Reynolds, likes to leak <laughs> things on purpose. I don't know what you're talking about. Ryan Reynolds yeah. never leaked anything. No, of course not. <laughs> totally. That's, no, no. Neither did oh, yeah. Tom DeLonge. No, of yeah. course not. No. Um, but, yeah, so I wanted to, as a big fan of Power Rangers, I wanted to sit down and give it a shot because like this obviously didn't get picked up. They wanted to do a little bit, and uh, Max was uh, a little bit mad that they didn't pick his script. Uh, like he described it as like uh, kind of like a cheesy '90s kind of like. Uh, well, did he say like comparison to Chronicle kind of maybe? Or? Uh, I think well, he I think he remarked that the new version of okay. Power Rangers, the version we're getting, kind of looks like Chronicle. And mm-hmm. in his defense, it kind of does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it does. No, it does. Yeah, he. I think he uh, straight to like Alien Pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think uh, what uh, what he said uh, basically surmounted to. I wrote a, a, a love letter to '90s nostalgia, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they went with a ripoff of Chronicle. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, essentially. not essentially. not not hit, not in so many words. Yeah. Irony abounds. Yeah, exactly. So I read through it, and I guess my initial reaction was. I kind of went into it thinking this was going to be kind of like a stereotypical script, like pretty cut and dry. Very kind of like standard stage direction. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But having that little S- flair. <laughs> yeah, static. Like having that little Max Landis flair because I've seen some of his YouTubes. Like I've seen like the death and uh, birth, rebirth of Superman. Oh, we're all fans. The yeah. sleep like, and that's return. The sleep yeah. and return. Yeah. I, wrestling it's, isn't it's, wrestling. That's a great one. Too. Yeah. Uh, it's a what big, got me into wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big baby. and He just got the best big baby. <laughs> I love that bit. Um. So I didn't. So what I got, what we get though, is like he all that translates into the script. Like he, the script reads just like he's talking. On that one energy, of yeah, yeah, that same energy. I wasn't expecting that, but I went along with it because like I do like that energy. I just thought that it was going to be a little bit different, a little more stayed, a little more stayed. But you know what? Whatever. This was still something fun to read, like on the metro, something cool, to, like to see a glimpse of what could have been, what could have been. Um, so. That said, though, I did have a few issues. Like, I didn't really get the love letter vibe. Like, unfortunately, like, I think and you guys had made a comment, like, where he took the stance of, what was that other director that you were talking about? Like, that was, like... Oh, Shane Black? Or, yeah, yeah, just, like, yeah. how they were... Yeah. Shane Black always kind of, like, makes his, like, his scripts kind of have, like, winks to the script reviewer. Yeah. Um, Which doesn't mean that you can't still have a love letter there, but I, mm. I think there's... Again, there's more of a showmanship to the mm. to his script writing. Okay, um, like if you read his like Last Boy Scout or Lethal mm. Weapon two script, you're like, oh, mm. okay, you know, it's, it sounds very much like a like a Shane Black joint, mm-hmm. kiss mm. kiss bang bang. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, as far as like the action goes, though, like the action is all there. Like, there's a lot of cool things. Like, there's a big Megazord fight, and the thing is like breaking down. Like this this thing is like do you, they have Goldar. Yes, they do. They have <laughs> Goldar, and they have. Um, uh, Scorpina, okay. which was which was kind of great, and like they had a good description about her. I was just like, yeah, I'm I'm here for a sexy scorpion lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't, I don't remember the specifics about Goldar's description, but I still, it's still like gold armor, like. But I think they still give him a description of like half ape, kind of like the, the the ape face. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit more true compared to what we get with this giant gold thing in the uh actual movie. CeeLo Green. CeeLo Green. Yeah, no, exactly. Let's keep it let's see it topical. <laughs> um but uh so you've got those um compared to like what we've seen in the trailer for the current movie, you do get a lot more of the classic villains. Mm-hmm. Um so you've got uh you've got uh oh, gosh now Putty Men? You got a lot of Putty Men. Well you'd get Putty Men in the new one too, but I think they're more classy like, yeah. you know, wrinkled they're face. Actually... <laughs> yeah, blah 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 blah. Uh, How does he write that? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> How does he spell blah, 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 blah? You know, I don't know. I think they just say, it, say it's indistinguishable. Because yeah. a lot of the aliens don't talk in English, but they're written in English, so, like, the viewer can, like, yeah, understand sure. that. Um, but they definitely have, like, it was, like, Baboon and, like... Uh, uh, Finster, I think, is in there, and then like, uh, did it have the the pig guy from the the very the, first episode? The, the no, the first movie, the first movie. Oh, that I don't remember ever seeing in the no, TV show. No, no, they didn't have him. But you're right; that's like the one thing yeah. that he's in, and nothing <laughs> else. I, I kind of liked him; yeah. he was kind of fun. But they they kind of replaced him with uh, um. Uh, Rita's Rito, the brother of Rita. Mm. That that was a good because Golder needed a comedic duo guy. Yeah. That, I felt that. I felt that. You, you need that bebop and rock steady yeah. vibe. That's exactly what they went for. <laughs> um. So you mean so, Seamus? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess let me oh, <laughs> let me elaborate on stuff that I did like. Uh-huh. Let's like, make it a little positive. Yeah. So, uh, so I did like the Megazord fight. It was really cool because like the Rangers actually got out of the Zord to, like, try to fix stuff because, like, Scorpina was actually, like, ripping the Megazord a new one. Not big. Goldar was huge. It was a Goldar-Megazord fight. And um, Scorpina was actually on the arm, like, ripping up cables and, like, Zack gets out to, like, mess stuff up, uh, which that was pretty cool. Um, they did a lot of cool mythos things. Or, I should say, he did. Max did a lot of cool mythos things. Um, he came up with the concept that, you know, there's been Rangers before... Um, Zordon was one of the original Rangers. So his whole backstory he crafts. Exactly. Um, he kind of did something similar with his Ghostbusters 3 script where you oh. find out how Slimer be like who the ghost of Slimer is. Oh, okay. See, that's cool. Like, I like she? that kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> who is she? <laughs> but uh, so it's the backstory of like that Zordon gets stuck on Earth. There's no way for him to get out. So he's in like hibernation. Um, and that's where uh, Rita's staff is ends up being. Like they're all on Rita's staff. Couple other things, uh, Zordon ship. They're all on Earth. He can't leave. He's waiting for uh, his original crew, like these original teams of Rangers, to come get him. Never happens. Uh, so he's reanimated when um, Rita ends up on the planet. Like her and her crew ends up on the planet, and it's discussed how. She existed on the moon. Like, the moon was this kind of prison for the all these monsters that are now trying to come down in the moon to help Rita and get uh, her, what, her her staff, her source of power, um, to get that staff and to get her, uh, get her power back. Um, and it is established that she is kind of a part of Zed's, um, of Zed's crew. Like, she is a, I don't know what the term that they gave, but, like, she's under Zed. Zed's in charge. Uh, in fact, subordinate. Yeah, subordinate. And eventually they do... I do love the fact that there's this uh, after credits thing where, like, Zed comes up and he's got the Green Ranger coin yeah. and he's ready to throw down. Kind of kind of like the end credits scene with Thanos where he's like, ah, I'm going to put on the... If you got to uh, do something the, right, you got to yeah, do it myself. <laughs> the Infinity Glove or Gauntlet. The Gauntlet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to do that would Infinity be to court Glove. death. <laughs> oh, I have a hard-on for death. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it kind of looks like Donkey Kong in that scene, <laughs> I think. Yeah, do I you, agree. I mean, I already did the DK rap. What more do you want? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Donkey Kong is here. Uh, yeah. But no, I mean, so you know. There's some really cool. Oh, and uh, uh, Rita was a pink. Uh, well, I don't know if they say the color, but she was a ranger alongside Zordon. Defected because Zed tempted her with power. So that's a cool concept. Yeah. Right. Like there's some really cool concepts. I feel that I did not get into the characterization. The actual Rangers? The, the, a- the, the actual, current Rangers. The current Rangers. Because, unfortunately, the Rangers and Zordon, specifically, the characterization they gave him, because I kind of felt like, into what you were saying about like making fun, like poking fun at the characters to, like, to show the viewer, they made them stereotypical. And I guess that's what they were in the 90s, but I feel like in a movie you have to have a little bit more, especially like an origin story, maybe a little bit more development to them, like a little bit more meat to the bones. Like the very first introduction we get to J- to Jason, he literally punches Bulk and Skull in the face with with a kick. Like that never... Wait. I just wanted to point out, you yeah. said he literally punches them in the face Sorry. with a kick. His punches have the powers <laughs> of, of kicks. Where have I heard that before? The <laughs> kick puncher. From kick community. puncher. <laughs> yes. Um, sorry. No, he literally kicks them in the face. <laughs> literally punches them in the face <laughs> with a kick. You never. You're never gonna let me down. <laughs> no. Um, so like they're ragging on Billy, and like he the, he literally just slams them in the face, 
And that's something that, like, Jason never would do originally. Now, that may just be me being harping on, like, I love the original stuff. But it kind of felt, like, really... It doesn't feel like Austin St. John's Jason. Yeah, it felt really raw. And, like, Jason would... Original Jason would never, like, purposely punch somebody. He would, like, maybe slip them up or, like, make them fall on their face. But he wouldn't, like, no, you going down or, like, scare them. Mm -hmm. Um, So it, it seemed a little threatening. A little threatening there. Um, Billy is a 2D nerd for... for and I mean, you know what? To that credit, he was. You know, these are all characterizations... I would argue that he was the least fleshed out of the, yeah. Of yeah. the original core. Exactly. But then, like, near, like, the latter seasons, and then in Zio, they really gave him a cool character. Like, the moment they, like, made him not a ranger, that's when cool stuff was happening. He was yeah. building zords, like talking with like other ranger squads like he was a fleshed out character so you know and you know what maybe that's just me and my stupid opinions though because like originally they didn't have a whole lot of personality you know like you had to be cliche because I mean, this they was a kid show and they weren't really actors yeah. they weren't really and they, they were, were and it was all filmed around just clips from the super sentai yeah. show exactly exactly so all we had was like these short things of them establishing shots and things like that so all right so if you're building off of that okay but it still felt that, like, because this is a movie and an origin story, give me a little bit more meat. Um, Kim was uh, interesting. Have you ever... Do you remember the episode where Kim was, like... And Billy became bad guys? Like, yeah. or not bad guys, like, re- like leather jackets and, like, Hasta bandans. La pasta, yeah. baby. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever it was. Hasta la pizza? That, yeah, yeah. That's Billy her... Billy says something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's her description, pretty much right there. Just, like, the straight-up description is basically she's, like... You know, I, and I do have, I do have. A she's quote. she's black gloves, Kim. She's black gloves, Clint, Kim. Yeah, it's um, like the end of Greece. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, exactly. How's about it, stud? <laughs> Sandy. This Tommy's is just like I've got chills. <laughs> They're multiplying. <laughs> no, that's the. Uh, that's the. Uh, no, that's the the morph energy flowing through you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So this is one of the. Ra- this is like a quote. This is one of those raspy voice glower day ditcher kids your mom warned you about. So it's like, oh, Kim's. All right. I mean, it was different, you know? It was a different description. And all right. I mean, I went with it, but the, I guess the problem that I kind of had was that Billy and her ended up together. Like, in fact, every character besides Zach was dating another ranger. Mm. And Zach was just dating somebody else who they conveniently led on to the fact that they were rangers. Yeah. So I thought that was like a little interesting there. But like, we didn't. I mean, none of the Rangers dated originally. Like, we didn't really need. You kind of had like a, a love thing between Tommy and Kim. That's right. But that kind of stemmed over a development cycle. That wasn't like yeah. initially, like right from the get go. Yeah. Um, and even then, I feel like, granted, I haven't really watched the series since mm-hmm. I was a little kid watching mm-hmm. it. But like, I feel like it was always one of those things. Like, oh yeah, they're totally into each other, but mm-hmm. they're not dating. Yeah. No, he got her some flowers, but yeah. they're not kissing. Yeah. So. Uh, so, but no, like it's established it's that like every girlfriend I've ever had. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'll be your boo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but it's established that uh, Trini and Jason dated, but were breaking up because the summer was ending, and they're gonna like focus on college. So, summer like, loving, have me a blast. So, basically, what you're saying is that Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie is Greece. Yes, because yes. that's we've we've already <laughs> seen at least two parallels. Exactly, exactly. So. Uh, so those are my issues with the Rangers. I mean, it just it's a little off, but I mean, it's still it was a fun read, you know. Like it was different enough to like have a good time. I I get I don't I don't want to I don't want to lark on it because like some people may enjoy it, yeah. you know. Because like some I mean Max has done like a lot of different cool adaptations, so I I don't want to take away. He's about to uh, he's about to direct a remake of his uh, of his favorite film of his father's. What's that? An American Werewolf in London. Ooh, yeah, I'm down. A, directing a remake. I'm nice. down for that. Because he, in his own words, he's like, "I wouldn't. The remake was going to happen anyway, so might as well. I would do, wouldn't trust it with anybody else." Yeah. There you go. There you yeah. go. So, I don't know. Inter- interesting yeah. read. Um, no complaints. But I mean, like, it's still cool to like see this alternate take. Yeah. yeah. So, still excited to see what we got, though. Yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah. It comes out and, what uh, March, like, right? May, no, May. I thought May. May. It's one of those M words. Yeah, one of those M words. I think March is something. <laughs> March. Oh, am I flipping it? Is it March for Power Rangers? May for Spider Man? Sp- Spider Man isn't until like June or July, dude. <sighs> I should be a better fan. I pay attention to that show. <laughs> you are. I just so know that it's, it's far away, and that like I've already. May pl- is Guardians too. I can tell you that. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, all I know is that I'm going to try and my darndest to convince my job to like let me dress up that day. Even <laughs> even if it's just like on the metro, just I'll just hang out. I'll just chill. Let people awkwardly there's some creepers cuz I did it for Halloween. <laughs> I did it for um, Halloween. What's that? For for anyone actually concerned, the uh, uh according to Google, the release date for the Power Rangers movie is March 24th. Nice. This year, 2017. Okay. Nice. Okay. Um, but no, like, uh, like I'm, I'm just chilling in my mask, in my, in my skin tights, you know, hanging on the Metro dude tries to like awkwardly take a photo, like, you know, pretending like he's on the phone. I'm just like, really, really dude. Yeah. I'm the most flamboyant person you'll ever, ever meet. I, I'm, I'm in a costume. I will pose for you. You jerk. So now I know how girls feel and that it's not uncomfortable. It makes me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. We went, we went, okay. we went really deep right there. <laughs> so... You guys saw the Lego Batman movie. We did. We did. It was it was a pre Valentine's date. Yeah. <laughs> Palantines. Oh. Palantines. <laughs> we don't we don't kid around. This is Valentine's. <laughs> yeah. This is my bro. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is this episode comes out on Valentine's Day. So, yeah. so yeah. hurrah. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, happy yeah, Valentine's happy Day. Happy Valentine's Day. From what? me and my Valentine to Aww. you and your Valentine. What's uh, yeah, Jake isn't here right now. What's yeah. the uh <laughs> Um, yeah, because I guess he would be your Valentine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the um, all by yourself. <laughs> Don't wanna be. I wanna know what love is. <laughs> I, I want, want you to show me. me. What's your favorite love song? Ooh, you had to put me on the spot. He well, does this all the time. Uh, yeah, jeez. I mean, I'd have to go I do it to our guests too. Yeah, if you listen to our interviews. Okay, so <laughs> it's not super duper love song. But I do love this one. As long song. as it's a love song to you. Yeah. You know what? You know what I'm gonna go for? I'm gonna go uh Walk the Moon, um Shut Up and Dance with Me. I love that. Oh, I love that. That's yeah, a good that, that's one. got a lovely eighties feel to it. Got a lovely feel. I know yeah. it's on the radio all the time, but just like I love it just like, dude, just stop talking. Just get on the floor. I got my trucks on, let's go. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of fun. Some good advice for everyone. I'm yeah. a big fan of Just Like Heaven by the Cure. Yeah. Oh, you old soft to you. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> and bass, everything. Yeah. Ah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I believe, in a thing called love. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, did I just kill the audio? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, actually, we're, we've had worse. But yeah. uh, <laughs> Jake. Jake. <laughs> he yells a lot into the mic. You know what? I'll, fo- I'll throw this one in as a half one because it's a <laughs> fictional song. Okay. Uh, Pop Goes My Heart from uh, Music and Lyrics. If you've ever seen that movie. No, no. I'm sorry. It's a very, you know what? It's a cheesy, like, kind of like uh, 2000s uh, release. Uh, rom com. Rom com with uh, a, it's got um, God Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant. Of course, it's got Hugh Grant. Drew Barrymore. Drew it was, Barrymore. It was an early 2000s rom com, so there's like a 90 percent chance, chance that Hugh Grant's, Grant's in there. there. But they have this bit where Hugh Grant was a part of like an 80 80 cheesies band, mm-hmm. and then they make the song. I said I wasn't gonna lose my head, but then pop. Goes my heart. Oh Pop yeah, I've heard that. Heart. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's from the movie. It's yeah. movie. It's really cheesy. It's fun. I think you know. I think I think I randomly caught some of that movie, and it was yeah. like the scene where they're showing like them uh, him perform that. that yeah, song. yeah, yeah. Or a scene where he's performing it. He's like doing a little hip dance. Yeah. <laughs> so that you know what? If you look for a movie, watch that movie for Valentine's Day. It's rather sweet. There you go. Think what would I want to watch on Valentine's Day? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, uh, it's what I watched for Valentine's Day last year when I, I went know. to see it. I really liked. Uh, I really am a big fan of Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah, Tom Hanks man. Tom yeah. Hanks man. Oh, of course, I've always been a Tom Hanks. Yeah. Tom's yeah. I like Tom that guy. Hanks is great. Yeah. What about uh, you? Got mail? That's fine too. That's yeah. good. But yeah. you like? Would you like Sleepless in Seattle? I grew up at Sleepless in Seattle. Okay. You for, got mail came out like in what, like two thousand two ish. For me, it was big. That there you was go. if we're, if we're gonna go we're on gonna a tangent Tom Hanks. with Tom Hanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, do we have that's any, the one that I grew up on? Do we have any splash takers here? Actually, I, I I'll go with splash as well. <laughs> or Joe versus the volcano. Oh, oh my god! Yeah, my my mom's a huge fan of Tom Hanks, yeah. so we oh, watched man. a lot of Tom Hanks. Oh man! Yeah, man. Max big Hanks. is one of her two favorite movies, actually. Aw, that oh. and so I married an axe murderer. Oh jeez, yeah. Mike Myers, yeah, yeah, totally. So you didn't see John Wick too, even though you kind of. I really want to. You, we, we you saw look the, like if you Keanu grew Reeves. your hair about <laughs> right? another he's, like. I mean, he's I got the perfect facial hair right now. I yeah. did get it cut recently, so you I could have done need it to become a professional Keanu, Keanu Reeves. Reeves I mean, <laughs> I mean, or <laughs> like it, yeah, it just, just a uh, professional Keanu Reeves. Yeah, just Keanu Reeves. Hey, I mean, as opposed to Keanu Reeves, who's not a professional Keanu Reeves. Seriously though, I mean, I do have natural. I have the. 
<laughs> you need to learn bass, just like he I does. need to learn bass. Well, no, that's the thing. Ted Theodore Logan does not know bass until but, but, like the but, end of two. But but real life Keanu Reeves is the bass player for a metal band for Dogstar. Dogstar, oh, that's, that's their name. Really, that's really cool, actually. Yeah. Okay, but I do have. He a, also actually knows how to like shoot guns. If you ever saw the training video, I yeah. did see the videos like training for um, John Wick Two. Do you want to go to a shooting range? I've been to a shooting range. Oh. Do you, you want to go again? Can, yeah. I can go. It's yeah. not a one time. Wait, wait. So you want me to dress up in a nice dapper black yes. suit? We need a stuffed dog. We need a stuffed dog. I don't think they'll let an actual dog. I'll just dress up as Mog from uh, from uh, Spaceballs. That's really weird. <laughs> but I do, ha- right? I do have a Ted Theodore Logan outfit that I wore to New York Comic Con when they were premiering John Wick 1. Yeah. And I really tried cool. so hard to get into that showing. I didn't make it. I didn't make it, but it's a really good costume. It's a really good costume. I've gotten, co- I've got a, because uh, I took it to uh, a Renaissance fair, and they, I got one of the dudes to break character because it makes sense to bring Ted to a Renaissance fair. You know, yeah. they have some historical babes. Yeah, um, it's like it, it's it's like wearing a Star Trek uniform to a Ren fair. Yeah, they that's both true. travel through time. They both travel through time. <laughs> I can't blame. Them. I know people look down on Star Trek, but le- Star Trek going to Renaissance fairs. But I can't. I can't. Well, it's personally. because Big Bang. Theory did it, so therefore uh, everybody's gonna not, do it now. Now it's not cool. Yeah, I um, I I, I need a mask. Damn you, CBS. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I did get him to break a character because like he saw me and he walked past and he turned his head to me, nice, and kept going. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, nice, nice. nice. But yeah, uh, I mean, we'll we'll talk about John Wick too when when uh, my uh, Valentine gets here. But uh, yeah, I'll see it eventually. Yeah, I know it's good stuff. It's I mean, a, I hear good things. And I like corners here for $5. Oh. Yeah. Well, wait, don't I have to see it during like a matinee time? You have to see it on uh, any, any all day Wednesday. It's $5. Like even at night? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, then. All day. Oh. Well, then I can hey, probably. you want to go Wednesday? <laughs> Let me check my schedule. Okay. I gotta make schedule because I still haven't seen it. Oh, all right. Mm-hmm. Although Carlos do. really wanted to go see it with me, so we well, might have to if incorporate he gets dips, him. If he gets this, we'll chat tomorrow at Valentine karaoke time. Oh yeah. You should be there. Neither of us have dates. Not none of us have Whoa. dates. <laughs> Presumptuous. I well, you're my date. That's true. <laughs> so therefore, so two kind of, of us have dates. Okay. okay. Caught in the middle okay. of these bedroom eyes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yes, I think you were getting at uh, Lego. Oh, Lego Batman! Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the thing that we started talking about right after you were done. Yeah, that was a good. Oh, that was a good time. We kind of tangent all the way over there. Uh, but no, it was a really good time, dude. I like, I really enjoyed it. Like, I don't know a lot about Batman, but I got a lot of the Batman references in there. Even, even Gentleman Ghost. You know, I don't think I'd got Gentleman Ghost. I, I got Condiment the, King. Dude, I saw the episode I with Condiment King. So, I got so excited when Condiment King came on the screen. I was like, yes! <laughs> and the Condiment, Condiment King! King. <laughs> Orca. Oh, it's my God, Orca. <laughs> just a freaking... It's just a whale? My favorite is, like, when, like, um... Uh, obviously, spoilers for Lego Batman. You know how the show works. Like, when, um... Killer Croc arms the bomb, he's like, I did something! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did something for what? I was surprised if they got a killer croc or like w- why why didn't they get like bat cow get some bat cow in there Ooh. get something really weird that nobody's gonna get yeah bat cow ace the bat hound oh, like man. there's so much get some cool shit because they had like uh, didn't they have like crypto the super dog like doing the turntables yeah. at the party yeah, yeah. yeah or they, was that or was that the dog from the Wonder Twins no it was no because it no, it's a monkey from the Wonder Twins it's yeah. Gleek but uh, my favorite my again spoilers my favorite yeah. joke in the entire film yeah. When the Martian Manhunter goes, more like Martian Dance Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, uh, my God. I, I laughed so hard that yeah. the people around me in the theater started to, like... Is he okay? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that that entire bit right there was amazing. Yeah. Um, seriously, though, like, I think my favorite bit, the, like, the one adult joke... That they used with a uh, with they used with Robin. It's like, oh, my friends just call me Dick. Oh, kids can be cruel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I loved all the different properties that they were able to get in there. Like, oh, naturally, goodness. it's Lego, so they technically you know own right various and Warner Brothers, yeah. yeah, and then and yeah. Universal. Like they have yeah. all the Universal yeah. model monsters there. Uh, yeah, uh, it's is is Universal or are the Universal monsters uh, somewhat owned by? Warner Brothers at this point? Uh, no, I mean, Universal still is its own thing, but... Yeah. Um, but they had Dracula and, like, yeah. the Swamp Thing. Dracula and... Uh, they didn't have the creature, but they had the uh, they had King Kong, who's Universal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then that, that just generic sea monster yeah. guy, I think, is what you're 
referring well, no, no. to. I, I feel like the pretty sure generic... they had like a. Uh, I'm pretty sure they had like a dude with like a mask on his face yeah. and shit. I feel like the generic sea monster was from Clash of the Titans. That uh, could be it. That kind of looked like um, the l- the um, kraken. Uh, Flesh the kraken. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the non-squid or octopus kraken. Yeah, yeah, because uh, they probably needed to spread yeah. it out because like they had but, a yeah. lot of problems. You had, you, but you had Sauron. Yep. You had Voldemort. Yep. Um, Gremlins. You, you, you had, you had, you had Daleks. Although yep. they were just called space robots. Yeah. Uh, did they? Well, they did say exterminate. So they yeah, did they, have the they right said to exterminate. Say that. And then yeah. like Batman's like, ask your nerd friends. Yeah, yeah. Google ask it. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth probably, Google? probably <laughs> worth the Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it was just. It was. It was. It was so much fun. Yeah. Because like a lot of these jokes that were like in jokes are really fast paced, so it doesn't take anything away from people that are just watching the movie. There, so many Easter eggs. There yeah. was there was a father sitting next to me, like his mm. kids on the other side. Mm. Uh, but like I feel like the father was laughing more than the kid. Oh. Like the kid laughed at all the like you know the the the, the kid jokes, you know. But like I only the have father, one butt. <laughs> the fa- the father would like chuckle at those jokes, and then when they would like they like would reference like Batman sixty six, mm. he'd be like. Whoa! <laughs> Batman eighty nine. Every single Batman yeah. thing gets referenced. Yeah. I do love the fact that even even the the the, the, the cereals. cereals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I do love the fact that like for uh, and until they got to the like the original cereal, like everything else was like Lego ties, like all yeah. the different poses and yeah. everything like that. Yeah, and then it was Adam West dancing like, live action. That was really Batuzzi, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't beat that Batuzzi. Mm-hmm. I've seen that episode. I love the bit. The first one. I love the bit in uh, Robot Chicken where they're like they start bringing an alternate alternate like Batman and Superman. And he's like, well, what can you do that he he can't? The Batusi. And he just does that. And he's like, wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> you can't stop that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was just such a fucking fun ride, man. Yeah. 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 So good, and I love the characterizations of like I know they had too many villains to like focus on each one of them, but Joker, Batman, and like Harley Quinn. I loved how they treated Harley yeah. Quinn. Yeah. She yeah. it wasn't like over sexualized, and it wasn't like I would hope she, not for a kids movie. Yeah, yeah. it's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. But uh, and it wasn't like uh, and it wasn't like she was taking shit from Joker the entire time. They yeah. both had ideas. Yeah, they both had ideas. It was not a abusive one sided relationship. Yeah, exactly. Just, just a henchman. And I love her roller skates. Her yeah. roller skates. And I, I like that she got to be Dr. Harleen Quinzel, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. Just yeah. be like... And was able to just whoosh, change. <laughs> it's a Lego movie. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, man. It's just a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, uh, there's a very good chance that I'm going to see it again Aww. this Thursday with, well, uh, with my friend who's in town for Katsukon. Oh well, it's worth it because like there's so much stuff that just goes by at like a breakneck yeah. pace. You almost have to buy it on DVD just to like pause it. Yeah, you know. I mean, and it, it was the Batman movie that we needed, not the one that we had earned. Yes, <laughs> that's absolutely true. It makes me excited to see like what else they want to yeah. do. They 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 uh, in front of the one that we saw, Ken. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a trailer for a ninja. Or Ninjago. Nin- Ninjago. Ninjago. Ni- not Ninjak, the comic book. <laughs> Ninjago uh, Lego movie. So. Exactly. And they've been having some pretty successful Cartoon Network shows with that plot property. So yeah. uh, I'm excited to see now that they've got like a budget. And they had some really, some funny jokes. Some funny jokes. Yeah. I, I know this isn't, probably isn't aimed toward like a mixed audience like Batman was, but it still looked pretty funny. Yeah. Like, it's like. It was, it was, it looked like it was worth a, uh, like a worth a watch. Worth a watch. I mean, I might do matinee. Yeah, my name, my name. Maybe check it out when this comes on DVD. But uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, you know those are. Oh, and they got Jackie Chan for like the old. That's dude. true. I, you know what? I would say I would pay money to see Jackie Chan as a as a voice actor because I know he doesn't. Maybe he'll get, win an Oscar for this one. Yeah, because like he has like three lines in like Kung Fu Panda movies. Yeah. It's I, 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 he's a good comedic dude. Yeah, use him. Yeah, use I wish you. Man. I wish you would uh, start making more movies again. Yeah. Well, I mean, isn't he kind of like cutting down on probably some is. That? He's. I mean, he's starting to get older, so I can yeah. understand he's not gonna do like the same stunt spectaculars. But I would at least like to see him like do some animated stuff. Like, yeah. you, get, you got a good voice, you got good comedic timing. Do it. So, I'm. Mean, we'll see what they do. Because I mean, other than that Ninjago, I don't know if they've announced any other Lego yeah. thing of magic that they do. But uh, you know, it, it, lightning struck tr- struck twice. Yeah. You know, I enjoyed both movies. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes! It was just, right. Again, it's just a fun. It's a jam session. Yeah, jam session. Yeah, all the history of Batman. In this mm. case, some. I mean, I loved it when they played the John Williams like, mm. yeah. like uh, Phantom Zone theme. Yeah, it's awesome. So yeah, definitely check it out. And you know, while you're at it, 
Check out Eclipse. Volume 1's out on Wednesday, uh, February 15th, in comic book shops everywhere in Comixology. Thanks again to Zach Kaplan for coming on the show. It really yeah. is, like, such a pleasure to get him on, like, really talking process. And it's cool to see. I mean, he, his first comic book hadn't even hit the stands the first time he was on the show. Now he's, like, writing an ongoing series for Top Cow, and, you know, we might see some other stuff, too. You guys got anything to add before we sign off? No, nah. nah, I'm good. <laughs> okay. I mean, because that, that was like the fun things that we did this week. We got to spend time together, Cruz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. And I'm Ken. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric Bonner. Fried chicken. Woohoo! This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual Catching Up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.